Forests are more than just trees. They are essential to a livable world. Yet the function forests provide is often unknown to us. They filter our air and water and are home to countless living creatures, including people worldwide. The beauty and benefits of a standing forest are irreplaceable. However, we're seeing these forests disappear right before our eyes. The climate crisis and loss of biodiversity are the two most significant threats to the health of our planet. Both are linked to the loss of forests. And we are not working fast enough to turn the situation around. For decades, mainstream forest management has been stagnant, but one organization has spearheaded a radical new approach. Pacific Forest Trust, or PFT, is a nonprofit organization that saw a way to align the natural powers of forests with the undeniable power of finance. Working with local communities and landowners, PFT has been shaping this model of restoring and sustaining forests across California, Oregon, and Washington, testing out ideas over the years in the Van Eck forests. While traditional forest management focuses on the output of timber and fiber, PFT manages for the whole forest, from the tops of the trees to the unseen root systems below. With thriving forests being the most natural solution to climate change, it's not enough to just plant trees. The loss and depletion of forests is the second largest source of CO2 emissions globally. The kind of ecological forestry that we're doing, the conservation forestry that we're doing, rebuilds everything. It's flipping that model on its head. I'm Lori Weyburn, and I'm the president and co-founder of the Pacific Forest Trust. We talk about forestry, but what we have managed for is just trees. And that breaks down the whole system. But by just tweaking our management, we can shift the paradigm about what forestry really is about. When scoping where they might have the greatest impact, Lori and her team hone in on forests, not government-owned forests, not forests and national parks, but private forests. Private forests are actually 60% of all the forests in the U.S. It's not the national forests, it's not the national parks. The dominant forest type is privately owned. We saw that as the most threatened part of forests. Because what are the forests that you can lose? They're the private forests. Those become the shopping malls. Those become converted to vineyards. Those are the ones that get liquidated for all the timber that's on them to pay the bills. Those are the ones that are at risk. And they're all interwoven with public lands ownership. So if you think about it, if you think of the landscape as a quilt, then those private lands, are the, that's all the moth holes. That's where you're tearing it apart. And when you tear that apart, you don't have the forest ecosystem. So what Pacific Forest Trust uniquely did was say, let's reweave that landscape. Let's reweave that quilt so that it keeps us warm, if you will, so that it is functioning as a whole. Well, I think Pacific Forest Trust has really changed the conversation dramatically. This expansion and understanding among private forest landowners and what can be done, getting both ecological benefits and economic benefits simultaneously. And that's been so much a part of the conversation, I think, is this notion that somehow you got to either do plantations or you got to preserve it. And that's not valid. Private land is where PFT can create the most change, which makes private land owners compelling partners. It started as a partnership between myself and a man named Fred Van Eck. Picture West Coast meets East Coast. Works in the forest, works on Wall Street. An unlikely pairing, yet a meeting of the minds. When I met Fred, it was in a slightly boring 
forestry meeting. And the two of us were standing on the side and we began talking about what we love about forests. Fred was an investment manager by trade. He also loved trees, birds, and other wildlife, just like Lori. And that began a conversation that has ended up in these demonstration forests of the Van Eck forests. Fred Van Eck is my uncle. And one aspect of Fred is that he was crazy about trees. He was also a very frugal investor and a very frugal person. Buying clear-cut redwood forest was a very natural thing for him to do. I think he would just see that opportunity. It's like, I can buy this for a song, and I know that forests regrow. There's an enormous synergy between how you manage forests well and how you manage your finances well. The philosophy that Fred had was to build and appreciate and hold and benefit. That's exactly what you do when you want to restore a forest. So the idea of working together to build back the forest space, to appreciate the full value of forests, both economically and ecologically, was what really clicked with Fred. A conservation easement is a legal tool that provides the freedom of forever. It gives the time and space to shift from thinking about the financial return of the forest over the next few years to the next century. And it pays for the time value of money to make that shift. A conservation easement is a promise by a property owner. It's legally binding for usually forever. You can do anything as a property owner to a property. This will limit your activity in one form or another. And in return, often the easement includes some kind of guarantee or financial incentive, like maybe a payment to offset the lost revenue that a landowner might get if they don't harvest their trees uh, in a particular year. Once you've granted that on a property, it takes the pressure off, you know, make money from it. And that was the protection, you know, effectively that was given to the forest by Fred Van Eck. Pacific Forest Trust is really one of the first organizations to pioneer the use of working forest conservation easements and essentially incentivizing landowners to do better forest management. PFT developed this tool that really embraces a dynamic model of conservation. That's now the national model for private forest land conservation, is to not just look at set-asides, to look at how these forests are conserved embracing a different approach to forest management. A conservation easement is a permanent legal tool. It'll be here forever. Our contribution to the carbon dioxide trapped in the atmosphere includes burning fossil fuels and cutting large areas of forests, often also turning them into sprawling development. Carbon emissions are the number one contributor to climate change today, but forests have the capacity to store this carbon, pulling it safely from the air and storing it for hundreds and thousands of years. The bigger the tree, the more carbon it contains. When we're talking about storing carbon, there's carbon stored in all the parts of the tree, and so it's important to try to measure that and get a handle on that. So the equations that we use take into account the branches and the bark, as well as the bowl of the tree. Each time we cut a tree, most of the carbon stored in that tree is released back into the atmosphere. Only a fraction stays in a wood product, so clear cutting and plantation forestry don't actually store more carbon, it's been the source of carbon. Investing in conserving and managing forests well is investing in climate solutions and increasing carbon storage. And PFT developed a way to get landowners paid for the additional carbon storage in their forests, adding to the payments for conservation easements. So we developed a, a law in the state of California that identified 
what's called a carbon offset, as a means by which people who have to emit CO2 can mitigate that to zero by absorbing CO2. So it's a part of the climate solution, and it pays landowners to hold trees and grow a bigger, older, more natural forest. If you can sell the carbon to keep it standing, you've been paid to keep that forest there, and then you can keep growing from that point and keep it at the most productive state that it's in. And because you've been able to sell the stocks as carbon, you've made money to have it stay at that level. An investor in a sustainable forest benefits by getting carbon credits potentially earlier on. They get less income from cutting down trees earlier because obviously that's why they're getting the carbon credits. But the beauty of redwoods is after 20 or 30 years, they're growing in an accelerated manner. So there's really more value to the forest long term by not harvesting so much in the beginning. Investors um, buy forest land generally to cut down trees and generate income. If you do it under a sustainable manner, you will hopefully get less income from cutting down trees in the short term. But in the long term, its potential will grow because the, the trees are bigger and can generate equivalent or greater income in the future. And that's one of Lori's great insights. Technological advances in the early 20th century quickly made clear-cutting the dominant harvest model, devouring all of the trees across millions of acres of land. The cycle from forest to trees to mill became an instant and efficient source of steady profit. I think originally the approach of going in and logging um, properties, even further back than 30 years ago, was going in and just you know, producing as much as you can, as quick as you can, and get it out to the mill and, and, and make that money. Some even justify clear-cutting as a way to reduce forest fires. Yet, clear-cutting forests has been extremely costly where the Earth's natural resources are concerned. PFT still cuts trees, but they don't clear cut entire forests. They look at the whole forest to determine which trees to cut based on what the forest needs for restoration and the landowner's needs for sales. You know, when we're done and we leave, the habitat and um, the property is left in a better state than when we started. So we're in not only cleaning out the small junk, but we're also cleaning out the larger trees that are rotting or, or failing. So that in the end, you know, 10, 15 years from now, the forest you walk into is a large timbered forest. If, if we can keep managing our forests like these are being managed here, there is a future in it. The loggers PFT employs in its ecological forest management use cutting edge harvesting techniques. Both the goal and the approach differ from intensive timber management, ensuring the forest is thoughtfully harvested and continually improved overall. Companies like Sargent Excavation, family owned and operated, bring a high level of understanding and experience to this harvest approach. Growing up, the model of conservation was about setting up national parks. My early career working overseas in sustainable ecological development has really inspired me.
And a lot of that work was built on these pillars of ecology in the forest arena, Jerry Franklin. You could say that our, our whole model of what we're trying to manage for was inspired by Jerry. Pacific Forest Trust is probably the most effective organization that I've ever encountered in terms of management of private forest lands. So the approaches that Pacific Forest Trust has taken uh, are ones that really enable private forest landowners to not only learn about, but begin to practice uh, alternative approaches that will sustain a broader array of forest values than traditional production forestry does. So the dichotomy in forest has either been set aside the old growth or just have really young stuff. And Jerry's work about valuing old trees, it's kind of like valuing the wisdom of old people. And that's really kind of the secret sauce, is you're constantly learning in academia and research about these new, incredibly cool, amazing features of forests. So how do you integrate that into management? The Vanek forests are living laboratories, a place to learn from the forest and refine ways to best restore and support forest function. Through years of trial and error, PFT discovered how to restore thousands of acres of wildlife habitats and advance other conservation efforts. When we pick up something, pick up an animal on one of our camera traps, it tells us about forest health. If we find a rare animal, especially something listed, like a spotted owl, which I have picked up on our cameras before, we use that to adjust our management style and maybe avoid an area if we are picking up these animals on a track where we potentially have a harvest that year. Just good indicators of forest health. Well, there's, uh, there's sort of two habitat goals that one has when you're trying to manage for spotted owls or, and for other older forest species. And one is protect what we have left. And as we all know, so much of the older forest has been removed, has been converted to industrial, very simplified forest. But the other goal is bring back or restore much of that habitat as much as possible. Pacific Forest Trust was doing that and is doing that in both, in both categories. Let's go check out the, uh, the bear wallow. Yeah, see if anybody's been by. Hey, check that out. Oh, yeah. Uh, there it is. Elk. Looks like the elk have been here. No, where's the camera? Have you checked it recently? Uh, let's see. Giacomo used to have it here. I think he moved it up because the oh, bears kept it knocking there it down. there it is. Yeah. But it's always amazing to me how a tiny little feature like this has so much wildlife in it. Managing with the forest, looking at it and building up on what it has intrinsically in it and work with that as we're seeking to restore the kind of vibrant, resilient world that we want. You'll talk to a forester and you say, what did you do today? He said, oh, I was just walking around. I was just looking. For them is really learning, okay, I want to open this up over here to get more light here. Or I really want to favor those wonderful hardwoods there because those are like the cafeteria for the rest of all the beings that live here. But you only get that kind of learning when you get out and you spend time in the woods just walking around. There's addressing the organisms and trees we can see in plain sight. Yet there's a whole network of roots holding hands underground and an entire ecosystem up above in the canopies that are disappearing. The uppermost layer, intact canopies, collect and store water, lower the temperature, comb pollutants out of the air, and house a whole world of unseen organisms. Fern mats play a key role in healthy canopies. These normally grow up in the very top of the trees. We thought, well, let's give it a shot down here and see if it'll work. This will also do. So it's been super successful because once you've got those spores going, then it'll take off on its own. Well, if we were to let the process unfold naturally, of course, eventually 
they would develop into this structural complexity and you would see this arboreal biodiversity. But that's a process that would require centuries. So if, if you could wait, but how long are you willing to wait? You're willing to wait for longer than the United States has been in existence before it happens? I think also the idea of letting things unfold naturally is problematic these days because none of this is natural anymore. Like what does natural even mean in a landscape where at least 95% of the Redwood Range has been logged at least once and most of that has been logged again? This isn't natural. So if we were in an, a primary forest or an old growth forest that had the big fern mats up in the canopy that could rain their little spores down onto the younger trees and disperse that way, sure, let that unfold naturally. But in this landscape where from the top of this tree, we look out onto this sea of young trees where there isn't a fern mat within how many miles from here, I have no idea. It's not going to happen naturally here. If we want the fern mats back in this forest, then we have to bring them in. If we don't manage forests differently, we leave them vulnerable and we lose an extraordinarily powerful tool to reduce climate change. When the trees are cleared, the canopy disappears. Without the canopy, we disrupt the source of water that feeds the forest and the habitats within. When all the trees are cut, the forest can't absorb carbon, resulting in too much carbon in the atmosphere. PFT is working with Steve and Marie to restore fern mats to the canopies of Vanek, testing out effective ways to accelerate canopy layer restoration. This will help these magnificent forests and us thrive as climate change makes the world hotter and drier. Over the years, PFT has been working with a whole community of people to prove the value and practicality of the forest climate solution. Anybody who follows social media, the news, reads the paper, listens to their neighbor, is hearing about crisis after crisis after crisis. It is absolutely urgent that we change that. The U.S. has a strategic advantage in the fight against climate change. It's vast forest land. We have the means in this country to make a significant impact by properly utilizing, managing, and conserving our forests. We have a few years to really turn our big ship of what we do in life around. We don't want to shut down what we're doing in how we manage in forests. We want to change its direction. By prioritizing biodiversity and older, more naturally carbon-rich forests, PFT is creating more resilient forests from their holistic approach of marrying forest conservation and financial growth. We can do so much in such a short period of time. On the Vanek, in 20 years, we've more than doubled the volume of carbon that's stored. We've more than doubled the amount of timber that we have here. We've taken off an average of over a million board foot a year. So we have been earning millions of dollars through timber and through carbon. And at the same time, we've doubled the amount of carbon that is stored both in the forest and then in these products too. This transforms what forest management looks like. If you manage for the forest, you get the trees. But if you only manage for the trees, you don't get the forest. You get these rows of lines, lines and pines, or lines and fir. Short-term rotation plantations deplete everything, from the soil to the water, to the biodiversity and the economy. It is a key part of the emissions problem we face today. Well, the CO2 sequestration storage is overwhelmingly greater in natural forests than it is in forests that are managed for wood production on very short rotations. Short rotation plantation management stores no carbon. You hear so much about tree planting as a climate solution these days. And the reason nobody wants to be against tree planting is it's like being against mom and apple pie. It's really sweet, but by itself, it's a sugar high. It's not enough to be a nourishing meal. The whole forest is the nourishing meal. When you're on short rotations, 
40 years, 35 years, 30 years. You have a net carbon debt that you're always repaying. And what we need to do, what we're doing on the Van Eck forests is we are repaying that debt and then we're setting up a huge savings account. So tree planting is a piece of the solution, but the driver of the climate solution is changing how we manage forests to really bring them back as forests, not as tree plantations. One of the things that makes working on the Van Eck Forest so wonderful is building a community of people who really make it happen. In forestry, what we do requires a team. There is no single shingle operation that gets it done. You know, every piece of what we all do is important for the whole thing to work out. And we have incredible staff and people we work with every day, the biologists and the archeologists and the geologists and the foresters and, all, and the tree fallers and especially all the way up to like the Pacific Forest Trust who creates the environment where all this can flourish. So there's a lot of players out there making this, making this happen that makes it functional. When you're doing something for the first time, you just have no idea if it's going to work or not. And you guys have really made something fabulous happen. I would like to see myself coming back down into this forest from the air because I won't be here anymore. But I can imagine what this looks like. And what I see is trees that are, you know, we have quite a few trees now that are five and six foot in diameter actually here. I see them being 10 foot in diameter. And I see our fish populations back in the stream here. I'd love to see marbled merlets coming up this little drainage here, coming up at three in the morning. They're going, they're going 60 miles an hour. This beautiful lark-like sound headed up. They're able to roost here. And then at about five in the morning, the logging crew is coming in and they're doing their setup and they'll be doing timber harvest on that day. And when they head home, the bears are coming out, having dinner, having a conversation. The elk come down from the top of Squaw Creek Ridge, they go through Field Brook, come through here. I'd love to see that. One of the really powerful things about what we do is to show what's possible. It's possible to create a more livable world. It's possible to address climate change. It is possible to bring back the biodiversity that we're on track to be eliminating. Benek shows how you do it.